Good afternoon, everybody. We're going to hold for a minute or two longer to make sure that our featured speakers um, have time to log on to the Zoom, and then we will be um, kicking it off. We will be granting recording permissions, um, so please direct message um, Katie Fouquier in the chat, and she can grant you all the permissions there, and we'll be started in just a few minutes. Thank you all for joining us. Okay, it looks like we've got everybody. Um, so let's go ahead and kick it off. My name is Christine Riggerman. I'm with the Oshner Public Relations team. And thank you all everyone for joining us today for a media briefing focused on pediatrics and COVID-19. We've gotten a lot of questions about that and there's a lot of things um, changing and we want to make sure to give everybody the most up-to-date information and answer your questions as well. Um, today we have Dr. Billy Lenars, our assistant chair of pediatrics. We've got Dr. Kathy Baumgarten, our medical director of infection control and prevention. And then we've got Dr. Jill West, our section head of child psychology. Um, we're going to kick it off with Dr. Lenars sharing an update about what we're seeing across the system when it comes to pediatrics and COVID. And we will be having a question and answer at the end. So if everyone can stay on mute until then, we'll let y'all know when we open up for questions. Thank you. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Billy Lenar is here again. I'm the system chair for pediatrics for Oxner Health. Um, and um, uh, the reason that we're gathered is clearly because we're starting to see um, more COVID-19 cases in children than we have before the Delta variant was the predominant um, and almost the only strain um, of uh, virus that uh, we're seeing in Louisiana. Just to um, give you some context, and it's unfortunately not a happy context, um, one of the ways that we measure um, the amount of virus in a community is looking at just all the tests that are done in a certain age group and the rate of positivity in that age group. And that has gone from um, as late as the end of June being below 4% for children ages 0 through 18 all the way up to um, almost 24%. Uh, now, and that's as of last week. So there is clearly um, a lot more virus in the pediatric community than there has been in the past. We're also seeing an increase in hospitalizations. Um, and it's important to note, though, that we are not seeing um, a tremendous number of critically ill children. But whereas we may have had no children in the hospital with COVID um, a few weeks ago, we've been ranging in the five to 15 uh, range um, the past uh, week or so. Um, there, um, the, the age of infected people and, and infected pediatrics, also a pediatric patient seems to be dropping. So we're seeing younger children than we have been seeing in the past. And to put this all in a little bit of context, we're hearing um, lots of people talking about children are being disproportionately affected by the Delta variant. Well, what I think we wanna make clear is that the Delta variant affects children basically the same way in the same distribution um, as the original novel COVID-19 virus, we believe at this point 
And what is different is that children now make up the most susceptible population because children under 12 are 100% not vaccinated. Whereas as we go up through our populations, um, even here in Louisiana with low rates, we have large chunks of the population who are vaccinated. So when people say children are more susceptible or being affected more, they are the most um, um, at-risk population by virtue of not being um, immunized at this point. And so we're seeing the effect of that with more children um, being affected. Um, and I do want to point out that um, children still um, are very rarely seriously or critically ill, critically affected by the virus. But when you have many higher number of them overall, we're going to see more of the children who um, get these rare and serious infections from the COVID. So that kind of, uh, from the COVID uh, virus, that kind of puts it into context. Um, the good news is that children age 12 and up are eligible for the vaccine. Um, and we um, want to encourage people to um, move their, their children, their teenagers into that protective category um, as quickly as possible. Uh, I know we're gonna touch on school reopening uh, a little later on in this briefing, but um, if I were a parent of a uh, 12 to 18 year old right now and school was about to begin, I would be running, not walking to the closest vaccine um, station to begin to get my child vaccinated. Um, there's nothing bad about schools and we're gonna talk about it more, but it does bring a lot of children together. And um, so we all as healthcare providers worry about the effect that that will have. I'm gonna to touch a little bit about what parents need to know about the COVID-19 vaccine. We wanna be sure that we're clear in the message that um, all children ages 12 and above are eligible for vaccination at this point and continue to encourage our community to vaccinate everybody that's available to get the vaccine. The reason being is our children that are not eligible to get the vaccine need to be protected and we know we can vaccinate those around them then we have less likelihood of them getting sick. The other piece of this is the American Academy of Pediatrics states that the COVID-19 vaccine is our best hope for ending the current pandemic. And this is endorsed, the vaccine is endorsed by the American Academy of Pediatrics. Uh, we know that uh, we hear that children a lot of times may be asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic. And so, you know, why should we then get our children vaccinated? We also know that those children can spread illness to others that are vulnerable in the household. And so if there's a grandparent at home, if there's an immunocompromised parent at home, a child can spread that to those uh, family members, even when vaccinated, and then uh, they can become sick and end up uh, needing care. Um, the benefits of the vaccine we know far outweigh any risks of becoming vaccinated. Um, we have participated in these trials, both in the adolescent and uh, adult groups. So um, our community has contributed to the data and the safety of these vaccines right from our communities. We're also participating in the Pfizer trial from six months to 11 years. We don't know when those trials will be over. We know that they're expanding uh, the trials to include those age groups and we do have uh, children from our communities that have been in those trials. Um, it is also important to know that 12 to 15 year old groups of children that were studied by Pfizer showed 100% efficacy um, for serious COVID disease. Um, they had 100% antibody response. We're again waiting for the information for the six months to 11 year old and we're participating in that. Um, there's a lot of misinformation and concerns out in social media, and we want to be clear about those, um, that people need to go to reliable sources of data for uh, accurate uh, information. 
um, including the CDC website, um, ACIP, American Academy of Pediatrics. But there's been no data or information that COVID-19 vaccines affects child development, puberty, or fertility. Um, we do know that there are common mild side effects from the vaccines, such as fever is very common in kids. And uh, sometimes this may happen more so after the second dose than the first. Arm pain or soreness is also a common side effect. Uh, some of you may have heard that there has been reports of myocarditis and pericarditis, mostly in uh, younger uh, adolescents after their second dose, and it generally happens in males. What we do know is this is a very rare occurrence. There have been uh, a thousands and millions of doses given and less than a thousand reports of this occurring with the Pfizer and Moderna vaccine. And we also know that those symptoms were mild and largely resolve quickly. Um, given the risk of COVID-19, we still recommend the vaccine be given. I will say also that we have seen uh, cases of myocarditis, pericarditis due to COVID-19 itself. And I've seen this personally um, in adults as well. So we know that this can happen with COVID itself. So certainly that's more of a risk than is getting a vaccine. Um, we will continue to update you with additional guidance and concerns. And then Dr. Lenartz, did you wanna talk about back to school initiatives? Uh, Dr. Lenartz, you're on mute. I would just add to Dr. Bumgarden's comment that we um, at our Hospital for Children have seen many more children with um, myocarditis, pericarditis, and MISC, which is multi-system inflammatory syndrome associated with COVID, many more after they have been infected by COVID than uh, after vaccines. Uh, and Nationally, the sense is that the uh, cardiac effects are rare and much, much less serious from the vaccine, um, the few incidents that have been reported than from the actual infection of the virus. So um, we don't want people to be confused about that because uh, both things affect the heart, but the equation definitely weighs in favor of the vaccine. Um, and not the other way around. Um, uh, so schools are uh, getting ready to reopen. Uh, the state of Louisiana is under a mandate for mask wearing um, for uh, all inside spaces where people who are not in the same household are within the same space. And that obviously includes schools. Um, we at Oxner have been recommending masking in schools um, as part of our advice um, going forward. And so we're happy that this will happen uniformly across the state and provide the safest possible platform for kids to go back um, into live education. Um, I think the other really important thing to point out um, when you're talking about schools is that, um, as has been mentioned before, uh, the, the, the data is now fully in on how adversely impactful it is for children to be out of school. And in some communities and some systems, an entire year of missed education, social development, emotional development um, has occurred. And clearly, as has been echoed by the American Academy of Pediatrics and many other organizations, that is also a health crisis. So, so the challenge is going back into school as safely as possible so that um, in-person education can resume. And the mitigation tools that we're using, if, if you will, are the same as last year, basically masking and distancing. Um, and then cohorting of young groups that can't stay as separated as we would like is another tool that the schools will use. But if there's a bright point here, the bright point is that children ages 12 and above can be vaccinated. And that will dramatically impact 
the um, spread of COVID within school. Dr. Lenars, um, Dr. West, could you speak to mental health and kids and how we're seeing the pandemic impacting this? Sure. Um, as, as Dr. Lenars has already mentioned, we are concerned about the social and emotional developmental needs that children are missing out on from being in school. Um, we, we know the American Psychological Association recently published some data from their Stress in America survey, and they're finding that there's a high number of teenagers who are facing continued uncertainty because of the pandemic and therefore are reporting high levels of stress, um, signs of depression. There's also data from the CDC that from April through October of 2020, the number of children who visited ERs had increased for, up from the previous year, 24% increase for children between the ages of five and 11 and a 31% increase for children between the ages of 12 and 17. Um, there, there are going to be changes that we see based on the stress that children are experiencing. Um, and and we, can, we can point to some common behavioral changes that we might see based on children's ages. Um, in preschool children, it's likely to see excessive clinginess, um, perhaps some separation anxiety, changes in appetite, uh, potentially some regression in previously acquired developmental skills like speech development, for instance. Um, in school-aged children between the ages of six and 12, it's most likely that we'll see things like irritability, whining. We might also see some changes in sleep, um, most commonly in nightmares. There might be um, com competition for parents' behaviors, especially as parents are continuing to navigate, um, trying to balance things like work and childcare related issues. And uh, similarly, we, we might see um, some somatic complaints in children, um, things like headaches, stomach aches. Um, and then in, in the adolescent age group between, you know, typically between the ages of 13 and 18, we might also see some physical complaints, headaches, stomach aches, things like that, sleep disturbances. We might also see some increases in risk-taking or rule-breaking behavior. Um, all of these things are, are going to be common behavioral changes that happen when there are high levels of stressors um, like what we're experiencing currently. I think it can be helpful for parents to, to help their children deal with anxiety. One strategy is to help determine, is this anxiety, is this an anxiety disorder, um, or is this anxiousness that we are sort of expecting because of the chaotic and ever-changing environment that we're living in? Um, if it's an anxiety disorder, we want to seek out professional help for that. If it's anxiousness, we want to make sure that we're validating the fact that most of us are feeling pretty anxious as we see uh, the Delta variant. Um, you know, seeing cases rising and things feeling like they are going backwards in terms of, you know, renewed recommendations about masking and distancing. Um, we also want to try to make sure that we're modeling good coping strategies for our children and encouraging them to practice those things, um, making sure that they are taking time off of electronic devices, doing preferred activities, finding things that bring them joy. Um, those are, are important, even in a chaotic environment, to try to prioritize. And sort of similarly, parents really want to do the best that they can to try to maintain a sense of routine and predictability for their children. Um, that, that can seem very difficult when things feel as though they're changing on a day-to-day -day basis. And so I like to encourage parents, instead of feeling as though they have to map out a plan or a schedule for an entire week, perhaps just sharing with your children what they can expect for the following day giving them some um, sense of what's to come and, and what they can predict in their environment can really go a long way for reducing stress and anxiety. Thank you so much, Dr. West. And I know that um, a common question that we've been getting is, you know, from the physician's perspective, putting on that parent hat um, and asking, you know, what decisions you've made for your own children, what advice do you give your family members about this? Um, so if that's something y'all are open to sharing from that personal perspective, 
that would be that would be wonderful at this time. So I have three adolescent children, two uh, that are girls and one boy, and each of them have already gone through um, both Pfizer vaccines and are fully vaccinated. Um, I did not have any concerns about fertility, about future fertility in my children. I would have, of course, taken that into account um, when considering the vaccine. But again, the data do not support that there are any concerns about future fertility. My concern was to protect my children from getting COVID. Um, I would want to make sure that they are able to participate in school fully, fully as much as possible. And I didn't want to risk any long-term effects from COVID. I didn't want to risk them getting COVID and then have that concern that they could spread it to somebody who's more vulnerable in the environment. And so um, for our family, we chose to give the vaccine to all three of our adolescent children. I'd be happy to share that I have a, a five-month-old and a two-year-old and so are in a vulnerable group um, sort of doubly because they um, are, are not very good at uh, adhering to masking or distancing guidelines at their age. Um, and so we, we had recently um, the school that, that my children attend, they had an exposure to COVID there. And, you know, certainly that created a lot of uh, stress and anxiety for our our household, and it was it was difficult to um, explain to the two year old why he wasn't able to attend school. We were able to, you know, thankfully think of think of ways to kind of keep him in as much of a routine of his typical day as we as we could, and we tried to model his daycare schedule um, even while he was at at home and not able to go to school. Um, but but this this is certainly uh, something that that parents you know I, I can relate to how difficult it is to navigate these things having young children. And I have a one-year-old granddaughter who doesn't live in the area, but um, if uh, she lo was a Louisiana, and I would definitely have her in line, even to be in the clinical trials for the. Uh, younger children for the vaccine. That's how um, strongly I feel that it's um, uh, safe and important. Thank you all for sharing those um, personal experiences. We have gotten a few media questions submitted in advance, so we'll run through those and then we'll open up um, for Q&A. We wanna be respectful of everyone's time. One question we got in advance was, has anything changed with quarantine timing when exposure occurs. If I'm vaccinated as a parent and my child has been exposed or tested positive, do I need to quarantine? So if y'all could review what the best practice is there. So for somebody that has been vaccinated and exposed, the CDC does not recommend quarantine at this point if you've been vaccinated. They do recommend testing three to five days after exposure, however. They also recommend wearing masks. Um, so we continue to recommend that as well and are in support of the governor's uh, mask mandate. We wanna be sure that people are masking regardless when they are in an indoor environment um, in groups uh, and group settings. Um, so that's the current CDC guidance. I always say that because things change daily. And so that's today's guidance. So um, anyway, happy to take additional questions. Thank you, Dr. Baumgarten. Another question we received was, what symptoms should parents be looking for? And at what point should we be calling the doctor, getting a test? That's, a, that's actually a great question. Um, so really the, the reason to call a doctor or to have your child seen for COVID, um, I think the easy way to think about it is if your child had any other virus or flu, um, if they had a little bit of low grade fever um, and they're still um, eating some and drinking adequately and not getting dehydrated, and when the fever is down because you give ibuprofen or acetaminophen, 
they perk up and act more or less themselves, all of those things together um, are uh, an indication that there's really no reason to go to a healthcare setting. And in fact, you know, in a pandemic setting, you worry about being exposed to other, in this case, sick children. So um, we are uh, really um, trying to educate our families that uh, there is um, no reason just because of exposure or even if you think your child is sick with mild COVID symptoms, which again is 99% of pediatrics, um, it, there's, there's no reason to be seen. Unfortunately, we don't have an anti-COVID medicine to give. So treatment is symptomatic. It's push fluids, plenty to drink, Advil, Motrin, which is ibuprofen, or Tylenol, which is acetaminophen for fever, and just watch for um, the same thing, very poor appetite, not drinking, signs of dehydration, um, hard or fast breathing or worsening cough. And those are the reasons then that should maybe trigger a call to your doctor or a visit. Thank you for reviewing that. At this time, we're going to open up for verbal questions. Um, so if y'all have one, um, let's take turns, go off mute one at a time, and we'll keep an eye on the time because we want to be respectful of everyone's time this afternoon. We will be sending out a recording afterwards as well. Thank you. Hi there, uh, this is Emily Woodruff with the Times Picayune. I'm wondering if there is a threshold at which you all would advise schools that, okay, we need to go home. Like, like what does that look like if, if cases continue to increase? I know you've all said it's very important for them to be in schools, but at what point do we say, um, okay, we, we should probably stay home? So at, at this point, there's really no different tactic than we used last year. Um, and the, the very nature of the way the virus spreads means that it's really likely to be contained within a classroom or even a subgroup within a classroom. So uh, we as Oxner do not, you know, send people and quarantine people or close classrooms. The uh, Louisiana Department of Health does that, but in conferring with them at this point, they, they really, I believe, plan to use the same approach, which is a case-by-case -case evaluation. Um, and um, again, the, the very nature of the fact that we have spaces that are walled off, um, tends to contain an exposure um, or an outbreak if it should occur to um, a classroom or even a lot of times a subgroup within the classroom. And, and the other end of your question is, will there be or should there be entire schools closed? Once again, I would point to the fact that we know that it is really um, bad from a health standpoint to have children out of school. So, you know, we as advisors to schools and um, collaborating with the Louisiana Department of Health, our, our goal is really to do everything we can to keep kids in school. This is Rosemary Westwood with WWNO um, and WRKF. I was wondering if you could talk about um, pediatric capacity at the hospitals. I understand that um, in terms of ICU beds, pediatric beds are specific to children, like they can't, you know, transfer to a different type of bed for an adult, for example. Um, so I'm wondering about capacity for that. And then also whether you're seeing similar things in terms of pediatric care that we've heard from adult care in, you know, s someone breaks an arm and they can't get attention as quickly as they might have otherwise, or whether other types of pediatric care are being impacted because of um, the need to take care of COVID. Um, kids with COVID. So um, the, what you said about pediatric ICUs is true, not so much because of the space or the room or the technology, but the skill set of the caretaker team. 
pediatric nurses are trained um, specially to take care of uh, children and infants and and uh, pediatric critical care nurses have that special training. Um, so you're right, um, the beds don't immediately translate. Um, capacity has been um, noteworthy in that there have been um, moments and periods of time in the past few weeks where nearly all of the pediatric ICU beds in the area have been full. Um, we have not been in any situations where children did not get the care that they needed to get, whether it was for COVID or not for COVID. Good afternoon, Jennifer Crockett with WDSU here. I have um, a quick question. We have two big things going on right now. We have the mask mandate, which is new. We have kids returning to school, which is new. So what does your modeling show, you know, with the masks, we would expect the numbers to go down. With schools reopening, we would expect the numbers to go up. What do your models say is gonna happen two weeks from now or a month from now for the general population and then also for kids? Um, I would have to let Dr. Bumgarten speak to the general population. And on the, on the kid front, because it's a constantly changing fraction uh, that are vaccinated, and we hope that it's going to change dramatically when the next EUA for use in younger children is approved. Um, I would say we don't have a, uh, a model because we don't have all of the evidence or experience to model. We do know for sure that vaccination protects children um, against serious illness. Um, and we also know that masking prevents both transmission and um, becoming infected. Um, and so, you know, beyond that, with the Delta variant having a different level of contagiousness, I would say we don't have all the data to, to model. And also, um, you know, this will depend on how effectively uh, people mask. Um, in the experience that we had last year, school systems that did mask at all ages were very, actually very successful in impacting very few, relatively few children with um, quarantine outages and that type of thing. In terms of the data for masking and for vaccination, um, it's and the Delta variant, it becomes di it, it's difficult to predict what will happen because what we know is the spread will depend on number one, how many of our uh, community members get vaccinated. So we can impact this through vaccination. We know that it's not too late to do that. And the good news is we're seeing more people get vaccinated now. So we wanna to continue to um, uh, share that message. The second piece, as you mentioned, is the mask mandate. So again, that will depend on how people adhere to that mask mandate. We know that when we're seeing more circulation of virus in the community, we talked about in PEDS, our number being at 23% now, and it's about 22% for our adults. As that number goes up of cases in the community, when you're out and about, when you're in an enclosed indoor space, the more risk you have, the more chance you have of being in contact with somebody that's positive. And that's why we want people to wear masks when they're indoors, um, because we know that that will impact and can curb the spread. If we do everything that we need to do, we'll usually start to see cases drop about two to four weeks um, after we institute these measures, but there's always a little bit of a lag time and there's a give with that. And we know right now we're not having a curve up. We are having a straight line up in Louisiana. And that is directly proportional to the number of vaccinations we have in the state. So because we have a low vaccination rate, we are seeing more cases in Louisiana go up at a more rapid rate than anywhere else in the United States. And that is because we have the lowest number uh, vaccinated uh, in our community.
Yeah, I, as long as um, Christine says that I can give you the range, um, I will tell you that we have taken care of children um, from around a month of age to um, actually younger than a month of age all the way up through uh, 18 and beyond, obviously. Yes, and could you please give us an idea on um, how many had comorbidities versus how many don't that are affected by serious, you know, long COVID? Yeah, um, in general, um, patients that are, and I'm now referring to pediatric patients who are in the hospital with positive COVID tests, it's a, it's a very small minority of folks who are there because they are seriously ill with COVID. More, more commonly, it is a um, contributing factor or, or sometimes a coincidental occurrence when they have um, um, contracted it from a family member or something like that. So I'm just to be clear, I want to make sure I have this right. So the patients who have COVID, the young patients who have COVID who are hospitalized because they're sick, more of them have other serious comorbidities that have put them in the hospital or are these healthy children with no comorbidities who are very sick from COVID that they need hospitalization? So I, I may not have been clear. Um, of all of the pediatric patients who are hospitalized who have a positive COVID test, only a small number of them are hospitalized with COVID being the primary diagnosis or the, the, the main reason that they're hospitalized. It's more common for someone to just coincidentally have a positive test. Um, but that may not be in the in the majority of instances, that's not the primary reason they're in the hospital. We've got about five, four minutes. Christine, can I just add something to that? Of course. Clear. I mean, I don't, you know, I don't know the pediatric data as well, but certainly in adults, we uh, typically see more serious disease than those that have comorbidities. But with the Delta variant, we're seeing a younger group of patients in the hospital. That average uh, age of patients has come down in adults from in the mid 60s to mid 50 range. And certainly um, we've had young um, people without comorbidities die from COVID. In fact, you may recall, I mentioned on one of these um, press briefings about two weeks ago, we had just had a 19 year old with no other um, medical conditions that died from COVID. So unfortunately, that still happens, and we see it happen. Thank you, Dr. Baumgarten. That was a very good clarification to add to provide that context. Do we have any other questions at this time? I have a quick question. Dr. Baumgarten mentioned one of the reasons she got her teenagers vaccinated was to avoid the long-term effects of COVID. Um, could either of the physicians talk about the potential long-term effects for kids if they were to get infected? Um, in in um, children, the again, the multi-system inflammatory syndrome um, that I mentioned earlier uh, is a fairly protracted complication that requires um, IV immune globulin, sometimes other medication, hospitalization, and can um, take uh, quite a while to recover from. Um, there's also a subgroup of mostly teenagers who we are seeing with what is referred to as long COVID. So these are sort of um, run down, aches, headaches, lack of energy, um, fainting spells, you know, this type of thing. Uh, this was reported really first in adults, but we are definitely seeing it in a small number of teenagers too. 
And in adults, we see a 20 to 30 percent uh, risk of long-term side effects from COVID itself. Most often, um, abnormalities in taste and smell. Um, but I think I, I've also shared that we have adults that have had more serious disease that are in oxygen for months following COVID illnesses who can't walk down the block um, without feeling short of breath, who develop scar tissue in their lungs. Um, so there are certainly, there's neurological conditions that can happen, um, you know, weakness, um, tingling, paresthesias, meaning uh, tingling in nerves. So there are a lot of long-term uh, effects that COVID can have on uh, the adult group. Thank you. We've got time for one more question. And we will be sending the recording out afterwards. Hi there, this is Emily Woodruff again. Um, I'm just wondering, going back to the age of these patients, um, are they an age where they can be vaccinated? What are you seeing as far as their families being vaccinated? Um, you know, where they were exposed, are any of them vaccinated or, or can you give me some more details there? Um, so without, without going patient by patient, I really can't give you all of what you mentioned or have occurred. Um, you know, clearly we are seeing um, uh, the younger children we're seeing all are not vaccinated because younger children aren't eligible to be vaccinated. Um, and um, a number of the children in the older age group that we've seen, the majority of them are not vaccinated, even though they may be eligible. All right, thank you all so much for joining us today. We're gonna send out the briefing link as soon as we get that downloaded. I understand from the chat that there were some um, tech issues, so Zoom world, but we'll make sure to get that over to y'all. And if you have any follow-up questions, um, pr at ashna.org. We will also be um, having a system-focused media briefing, I believe, tomorrow. So information will be going out about that if it has not already. So thank you again, everybody. We appreciate 